Because he's the one that's taken Daniel there to begin with. And if this doesn't work out well, if Daniel doesn't know what he's talking about, Ariok could be collateral damage in this process. But Ariok moves quickly, verse 25. Then Ariok quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Now, when the king is mad and the king is, is wanting to kill people and the king asks the question, are you able to make, give me the answer I'm looking for? The very next word in the next verse should be the word yes. But that's not what Daniel says. Verse 27. Instead of saying yes, he says, it says, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. So his answer, instead of saying, yes, I can answer your question, king, he basically says, no human can do what you've asked. I'm assuming Daniel knew what he was doing here, because to me this feels like he's risking his life unnecessarily. <laughs> Verse 28. Daniel probably doesn't even use the period after king. He just probably goes right into the next sentence before the king has a chance to get angry. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. Imagine. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dreams and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. I imagine King Nebuchadnezzar is on the edge of his throne now. Because Daniel's either about to tell him this dream that he can't remember, or the king is about to get really mad. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. The future. This is a dream about the future. The king was wondering, worrying, thinking about the future. And it says, and he, referring to God, who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, the secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes, who, made known, who make known the interpretation to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. It's interesting to me, Daniel tells the king the same thing that he says earlier. The first reason that he gives that God is using him is he says, God has told me your dream for my sake. He has told me your dream for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's sake, so that we don't have to die. We focus on the next part, which is, in some respects, more important, but I don't know that it was more important to Daniel at this moment. The second part says, and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. That's what the king was concerned about. Daniel was concerned about staying alive. Verse 31, here's the dream. This is the part the king's been waiting for. You, O king, were watching, and behold a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet of iron and clay partly of iron and partly of clay. Verse 34, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that there was no trace of them that was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And I imagine in my mind's eye, King Nebuchadnezzar, who was sitting on the edge of his throne, sits up straight and lets the air come out of his lungs. And he leans back in his chair. Oh, yes, that is what I dreamed. And I imagine if any of the other wise men were around, which they probably weren't because they didn't want to die, but if they were, they said, there's no way we could have made that up. The king takes a deep sigh of relief, but this is only half of what he wants to know. That's the dream. But what does it mean? 
What is this dream about? The interpretation we find in verses 36 to 45, and, and we could spend sermons and sermons on this, and it would be well worth your time. For the focus of today's message, we're not going to dig deep into this part, but if you've never done it, it is well worth your time. Verse 36, this is the dream, Daniel says, now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are king of kings. You can see Nebuchadnezzar sitting up straight. Yes, yes I am. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power and strength and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. Well, yes. Yes, thank you, Daniel. This dream is going very well. I agree with your interpretation. But Daniel goes right on. But after you, and, and let me pause here. This is not what you say when you want to be on the good side of the king. You stop right there. You are the head of gold. That's the end. But Daniel was saying what God had told him. God, Daniel was not editing what God had given him. Otherwise, that would be the end of it. In fact, the book of Daniel probably wouldn't exist had Daniel stopped there. Because Daniel wouldn't have been faithful. But he goes on, verse 39, But after you another kingdom inferior to yours, maybe that is how you say it if you're going to say it, it's going to be another kingdom when it's inferior, then a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over the earth, and a fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. Verse 42. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it broke in pieces the iron and the bronze, the clay and the silver and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. I would love to dig into all of the intricacies of that. And again, if you've never done it, it would be well worth your time. I'm going to do what could be six separate sermons in one slide here. Daniel tells the king, you are the head of gold. You're the first part. And that another nation is going to come. The book of Daniel even gives us that nation, that next one, which is the Medo-Persian Empire, represented by the chest and arms of silver. History tells us that after that comes Greece, which is represented by the thighs of bronze. And then history shows us that next comes Rome, which is the legs of iron. And then finally, the feet are representing a divided Europe, the iron and the clay, the not mixing. And we have seen in history people that have tried to become world powers. We have today um, nations that are considered superpowers, but there is not a nation currently that is um, openly attempting to rule the entire world. Now, I'm not talking about what may be happening behind the scenes, but there is not a nation that lays claim and says, we are the ruler of the world. We are in charge here. And according to this prophecy, and history has bared it out thus far, those that have tried to become the next ruler of the world have failed, one after the other. In fact, the only thing that's missing is that last part where Jesus comes. That stone that's cut out without human hand that destroys the, the last vestiges of a kingdom 
It fills the whole world and becomes a kingdom without COVID, a kingdom without cancer, a kingdom without politics, a kingdom without riots, a kingdom without, and you can fill in the blank. We're living in the last days, and even though it may make us say our future is uncertain, it's uncomfortable to think about what's coming next. We're right at the very end. I want to wrap this up with the last few verses here. Daniel 46 and 47 says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face prostrate before Daniel, not a way a king typically acts, and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. So Daniel did a good job of telling the king, this is not coming from me, this is coming from God. And the king gives glory and honor to God. And in the last couple verses here, verse 48, Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Also, Daniel petitioned the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. If you read the chapters in Daniel that are narratives, almost every single one ends this way. The king at the time gives Daniel rewards because of the way God worked through Daniel. And I tipped my hand a couple of slides ago, this kingdom that we're looking forward to, is the best kingdom. We might not know what our future holds exactly. We might not know if we're going to be able to make our next house payment or if we're going to have a job to go to next Monday. We might not know exactly how we're going to do fill in the blank. But God knows. God has the answers. And God gave Daniel a big overview of history but Daniel did not have the opportunity like we have had to see that things worked step by step by step by step, just as God predicted. And I would like to suggest that God doesn't just know the big picture. He also knows the little picture. He knows if you're ready for your math test Monday morning. He knows if you're a little short for rent at the end of the month. He knows what's in your cupboards. And I think we can look at Daniel chapter 2, among other things, and say, if we can trust God to see the big picture, we can trust God to take care of us day by day. And things may not be fun. They may not be enjoyable. They may not even be exactly the way that we want them to be. But God knows and He's got a plan for the story of Moses, and I'm going to close with a, a very short summary of his story. At the end of his life, after 120 years of being headed towards the promised land, he gets mad, he loses his temper, he hits a rock with a stick. And God says, you can't go into the promised land. The book of Jude talks about um, Moses now being in heaven. Do you think Moses is in heaven... And he's talking with God, and he's saying, it's really nice to be here, God, but I wish you would let me go into the promised land. <laughs> Somehow I don't think that's what's going on. In fact, I think Moses would tell us he is in the promised land. Yeah. I give that illustration to wrap this up because I would say that if we wanted to make a list right now, we could make a list of things not being the way we want them to be. Moses wanted to go into the promised land with his people. But now that he is with God in heaven, one of, I believe, three individuals that the Bible tells us are in heaven right now, I believe he would say God's plan was worth it. Yes. It may not have gone the way I thought I wanted it to go when I was on earth, but God's plan was worth it. And I believe the same is true for us. We may not be completely happy. We might not even be 99% happy. We're 1% happy. We might think, Lord, I really wish things could be different. 
But I think if we hold on to him, when we're in heaven, we'll look back and we'll say, Lord, thanks for doing what was necessary to get me here. Have faith. I don't know your situation, but I know that God knows. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this may be the hundredth time or the first time that people here today have heard this story. But I ask that our faith would be strengthened as we remember or learn for the first time that, that you know history from the end to the beginning, beginning to the end. And Lord, I ask that our faith would be strengthened as we see that you know step by step what's going on. And this helps us to have faith that the final phase of this plan, that rock being cut out without human hand, the second coming, your kingdom is imminent. Lord, I don't know if it's going to happen in 2021. It would be wonderful to have this mess over. But if not, I ask that you would help us to be faithful until you do come. Thank you, Lord, that you know, that you care, that you love, that you love us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.